James Buckley <clears throat> scored the most startling political upset in the nation last fall when the voters of New York sent him to the Senate of the United States on the Conservative Party ticket, the closest historical precedent being the election in Dublin 20 years ago of a Jewish mayor. The Conservative Party of New York was then only eight years old, and the notion that it would ever prosper in the liberal soil of New York was held to be either romantic or perverse. But the notion that it would ever germinate a United States senator was held to be otherworldly, so that the election in question tells us a great deal about New York that we didn't know, and perhaps a certain amount about Senator Buckley that we didn't know, or perhaps more accurately that you didn't know. My brother was born in New York in 1923, he attended schools in France and England. He graduated from the Millbrook School in Millbrook, New York, and then from Yale University, where he majored in English literature, served on the college daily as a columnist, and maintained a pet boa constrictor who accompanied him to select classes. He then <clears throat> joined the Navy and was an active duty aboard an LST for over three years in the Pacific as Lieutenant J.G. After the war, he attended Yale Law School practiced in New Haven, Connecticut, and went into business in New York City. He managed my campaign for mayor in 1965 and ran as an independent against Senator Dravitz in 1968. <laughs> In 1970, when I was a 20-year-old college student, I had the privilege of leading thousands of young New Yorkers who were campaigning to make Jim Buckley their U.S. Senator. Uh, he was the most thoughtful, principled, honest, intelligent, and humble candidate we could find anywhere in 1970, or that I've found since then anywhere. And he won on a third-party ticket the Conservative Party of New York. I, I believe that anything which is founded on reality, anything that's going to open up the opportunities of an individual, anything which is going to give each person a greater opportunity to express his own individuality and achieve his own goals, is going to be ultimately attractive. We've had a lot of promises thrown around this country by the liberals for many, many years, and but we've only had enough historical experience with them to find out that they're bankrupt, that they just don't work. But I believe that one of the problems we've had uh, in this country is that to the extent that we start transferring responsibilities to bureaucrats who are not responsive to anybody, uh, to the extent that we transfer uh, the seat of bureaucracy from the city and state to Washington, to that extent the citizen starts getting a feeling of helplessness, a feeling that he really has no control over his own destiny, so what's the use? And I think the one way to start doing that is to start returning power from Washington to, to local areas, start dismantling uh, a red tape. I don't think we're going to get there by reform. I think we've just got to abolish a lot of federal fo uh, uh, programs so that those responsibilities <coughs> can be reassumed at, uh, at levels of government that are closer to the people and therefore where individuals can see how things operate. I believe that one of the problems uh, that we constantly confront in a, in a, in a society such as ours is uh, the need uh, to educate. And I believe that it, it is a responsibility of being uh, in the Congress to try to explain what the issues are. Uh, after all, it's your job to wrestle with them, to, to do the research, to, to look back into history, to examine, to uh, uh, project. And I believe that if we relegate the job of Congress to that of just reacting to popular stimuli, we're not doing the public a favor. I propose an extraordinary act of statesmanship and courage, an act at once noble and heartbreaking, uh, at once serving the greater interests of the nation, the institution of the presidency, and the stated goals for which he so successfully campaigned. That act is Richard Nixon's own voluntary resignation as President of the United States. Uh, last March, Senator James L. Buckley of New York, who by the way is my brother, proposed that President Richard Nixon should resign. Not, he was careful to stipulate, by confessing his guilt uh, in the Watergate cover-up, but in order to spare him and the Republic of the ordeal of a prolonged impeachment trial, in due course, Mr. Nixon did resign, although by that time it was too late to leave ambiguous the question of his guilt or innocence in the cover-up. Uh, his guilt had been established by that final tape and acknowledged by every member of the House Judiciary Committee. Mr. Nixon would have been better off resigning in March and taking his tapes 
Virgo in Tacta to San Clemente with him. The week after Senator Buckley's statement last March, Time magazine commented as follows, quote, Buckley's defection had a profound effect on conservatives, particularly on those in Congress. What Buckley has done is pull a plug on the president's most important reservoir, said Howard Phillips, a Washington lobbyist for the American Conservative Union. At the very least, Time concluded, Buckley's pronouncement will force many on the right to reconsider the reasons why they want Nixon to stay in office. I would say that uh, the Watergate episode and others leading up to, to it uh, in, in very real senses, I think, illustrate the, the fundamental conservative principle, and that is if you uh, concentrate enough power, especially discretionary or arbitrary power in any one place, at some point or another, it's going to be abused. The court's opinion exposes the fraud we long ago recognized in this ill-considered self-serving statute. It was enacted by a Congress whose members were more concerned with their image than in preserving our most basic liberty, the right to criticize freely our public officials and make criticism felt on election day. James Buckley will be recognized as the sometime sainted junior senator from New York. In the Senate, he was classified in a poll of staff legislative assistants as among the hardest working and brightest members of that body and by Jack Anderson as one of the top ten United States senators. He was defeated for re-election, perhaps for that reason, in 1976, and was appointed Under Secretary of State by President Reagan, and a year ago accepted the office of President of Radio Free Liberty and Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. The mission of, of Radio Free Europe, as I understand it, and I'm quoting here from something I was told this morning, is that the stations, quote, do not identify themselves with any opposition group or groups, political parties or organization. And uh, it seems to me that there was some criticism after martial law was Im imposed in Poland that the stations were being used beyond that mandate. For example, when phone service was cut for some hours during the day, the uh, station in Munich was uh, broadcasting messages to relatives inside the country. Is that something that, uh, that these stations should be doing, or is that transcending some line and somehow hurting the credibility? Mr. Buckley, I don't see whether this is a, a, a violation of, uh, of anything. If uh, you have an area of the United States where the, the, a storm, a hurricane, cuts down uh, the telephone lines, local radio stations are going to move into a humanitarian uh, aspect. We have the mandate of operating the way normal, free people would absent uh, 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 governmental repression. So you have no problem with that no, kind of no. activity? No, no. let uh, me make an observation. May, may I go a step further? Uh, you, you, uh, <coughs> in terms of our, our basic mandate, it is, no, we don't identify ourselves with any uh, party, this, that, and the other. We do identify ourselves with certain values, democratic uh, values, pluralism, freedom, uh, freedom to hear, speak, and, and so forth. We cannot incite to riot, uh, to revolt, but we have an obligation to report the truth, and that we try to do to the best of our knowledge. I first met Jim when I came on the court in 1986, and I must say, uh, he made a, uh, a quick and lasting impression, because he is such a, uh, a gentleman, really. In his time here, uh, he, uh, I, I think, uh, was admired and liked by everybody, maybe more than anyone else. The, the case that I remember most vividly in connection with Jim uh, involved the speech and debate clause, and it was a case where, at the point where we had conference, I was persuaded that the speech and debate clause applied. Uh, Jim thought the opposite, and Judge Mika felt very firmly uh, that it did apply. Uh, so, as we left conference, it was McVeigh Williams against Buckley. But then Jim circulated uh, what I thought was not only a very persuasive opinion, but a, an opinion that persuaded me to change my mind. And I, and I thought it was, in the first place, that's, that's very rare that uh, conference ends with a sort of clear two to one, and then uh, somebody switches. I think it's not merely his commitment to a sound view of the Constitution, but his fitting that view into a, uh, a 
realistic, realistic but idealistic view of what government is all about. And I think that's, that's why he's uh, been so fond of uh, Madison's famous phrase, starting with, if men were angels. And I think about. he was a natural as a judge because he is so even-handed and so clear in his insights. So he had touched all the bases. He had been in the executive and the legislature and the Senate before uh, coming to the court. And I, I'm confident that that gave him a, uh, a better understanding, a better feel for some of the issues uh, that would arise here, particularly with respect to relations among the branches. I, I have known Jim Buckley for decades. I think he was introduced to me by his brother Bill as part of Bill's effort to educate me about American conservatism. Since then, I have witnessed and been able to participate at the edges of his extraordinary career. I admire Jim because of his character, because of his decency in an America that is becoming more and more focused on the immediate. He's always stood for fundamental basic values that made America great. But he has done so quietly, unobtrusively, as a model. If all men were angels, we'd need no government. But they aren't, and we do. The good news is that that government has been a veritable employment agency for my father over the last 40 years where he was known for his unwavering integrity and his desire to work for the country and not for himself. Dodge, you're an exceptional, exceptional man, and it is good that this award is named for you. If the government were full of angels, they'd be full of people like you, Dodd. No one has served at all three levels of our U.S. government at such high points. U.S. Senator, former Under Secretary of State, President of Radio Free Europe, and as a uh, justice, as a judge on the appellate court for the D.C. Circuit, the second highest court in our system. Even now in his 90s, Jim is writing books and he's contributing to our national debate. He, his idea of phasing out federal grants and aid could really make a huge difference in our annual deficits and our national debt. With all his professional accomplishments, Jim has been a great father, a loving caregiver to his dear wife, Anne, who needed 24-hour care, a man of quiet and deep faith, and a mentor and role model to countless thousands, including me. God bless you, Jim Buckley, and here's a toast to you and to everyone who's honoring you there tonight.